Yesterday was Palm Sunday, and because it's such a special day, I felt very privileged to be able to deliver the sermon at our little church. I took a little bit different uh, path, a different way of presenting the Palm Sunday message, because in reality, everything that's encased from Palm Sunday until the crucifixion and from the crucifixion to the empty tomb, the gospel encases all of these and it encases all of God's dealings from creation until now. And so I decided that I would share this sermon again with you now in the hopes that maybe it will be a benefit, that it'll have some impact in your life. Now, before I go into the gospel, before I go into all of those things that matter so much, I want to talk about other gospels. And as I shared the sermon yesterday, I talked about an event that happened when I was a teenager and likened it to false gospels. You see, there are so many false gospels. There are so many people that are teaching so much garbage that we really have to understand how to identify and expose false gospels. And I said to the people, a false gospel is like taking a long trip to an uncertain destination. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about planes, and, and a week or two after that, another man gave the sermon at church, and he talked about automobiles. And today, we're going to talk about trains. And so there's a movie called Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, you know, it's kind of the, uh, the trinity of transportation, I suppose, if I can say that without being disrespectful. When I was in my middle teens, 15, 16, 17, I just kind of went crazy. I just took off and did whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, had no responsibility, no accountability, and really no thought to my life. And so one day, my friend, we were 16, I believe, and my my best friend Brian and I were down at the Ogden, Utah Railroad Station. And we were just kicking around, just killing time, just being stupid teenagers, just being dumb. There was a train that was preparing to leave, and it was obvious because of the activity that they were getting ready to leave. And it had three locomotives. And we just kind of got daring each other, got goofing off, got doing stupid things. And, and pretty soon we found ourselves sneaking onto that third locomotive. And we just slipped up there and then we hid. We thought, oh, we'll ride it for a little while. We'll see what happens. After a little while, the train began to move and it sped up and it just kept going and going and going and it sped off into the night. It was probably the, the longest night of my life because it was dark. I couldn't see. Now, there is one redeeming benefit, though. In the locomotive, the engineer seats, they're, they're kind of captain's chairs. They're comfortable. And there was a water cooler there with paper cups. So we could at least rest comfortably and have something to drink as we traveled. But it was a long, long night, just speeding out through the darkness. And... As the sky began to lighten, as, as it turned from black to gray, we, we looked out and we couldn't see anything. We just were in the middle of nowhere. And finally, we looked out and we could see a city appearing way in the distance. And we could see it getting closer and closer and closer. And so as we approached this town, Brian and I, we looked out the window and and as it rolled into town, we saw a sign. And we looked at each other and went, whoa, Elko. We, were tra we had traveled to Elko, Nevada. And, and now the train, it didn't even slow down. It just whoom, right through Elko and kept going. And we thought, oh, my, my gosh, where in the world are we going? Luckily, though, it did slow down and stop some eight or ten miles the other side of town. We were able to to sneak off, walk back up to the highway and start walking back toward Elko. And a kindly rancher picked us up and gave us a ride into town. Now, after riding all night and, and uh, well, that whole experience, we were hungry. 
And so we made our way to the local grocery store and we scraped up all of our change. Everything we had was only enough to buy two Hostess fruit pies. And so we bought those fruit pies and we went outside and sat on the curb and ate like condemned men our last meal. And so we were just sitting there eating these pies and wondering what in the world we were going to do when uh, a couple of girls drove by and they rolled the window down and they said something and we answered back. And yeah, before long, one thing led to another and they were, they'd stopped and they were talking to us. And we explained our situation and uh, they, they were pretty good to us. They, they went back to their home and they made sandwiches and they brought them to us. But I noticed that they didn't actually take us home where we might meet the parents. And well, can you imagine them saying, hey, dad, we found these guys getting off a train. Can we keep them? I just, I don't think that would have so it went off very well. So, so they made us sandwiches and, and we talked a little bit. And then things seemed to go from pretty good to even better. The girl said, we're going to the drive-in movie tonight. And if you can find a way to get in, you can sit in our car with us. Oh, we thought that was a great offer. That just sounded so perfect to a couple of teenage boys. And so that night we went up and we walked along the perimeter fence until we found a way that we could sneak in. And, and we got in and we started walking up and down the rows of cars looking for their car. And when we finally found it, we thought, hey, this is great. And then as we approached, we saw that these two girls were sitting in the car with their two boyfriends. I, I guess they got a better offer. So dejected, we left. We went and found a place to lay down, get a little bit of sleep overnight. And the next morning, we went back to the railroad yards, and, and one of the workers there said, this train, he pointed out a train, he said, that one is headed to Salt Lake. So we were able to get on a boxcar and make our way back home. Now, like I said, uh, a false gospel is a lot like a long trip to an uncertain destination. You just don't know where you're going. You don't know how it's going to turn out. I want to share some false gospels that I'm aware of. We have a Facebook group, and it's a group of ministry leaders who have come out of different false religions and now have a heart for their people, and so they reach out to their people, as Grace and I reach out to the Mormon people. Trek is former Muslim, and he's an amazing guy. Uh, in the midst of this war with Israel, he is going to be leaving in a few weeks, going to Lebanon, of all places. And so we're praying for success and safety for him. But I asked him, I said, tell me about the gospel that you grew up with. And he said, well... He said, the big thing is if you miss a certain number of the prayers, you know, they pray on a regular basis. They have a schedule to keep, and, and they pray. And if they miss, I believe he said it was more than three. He said, then you have no certainty that you will go to heaven. There's just no way that you can have any assurance, any certainty at all. And the only way to secure that, to give yourself a sure and certain knowledge that you will go to heaven is to die in the act of jihad. You know, killing unbelievers. In fact, he told me that those people that become radical Islamists who hijack airplanes and fly them into buildings or form groups like ISIS, these people aren't really the devout Muslims, but instead... They are the ones who have messed their lives up so badly that jihad is their only chance of salvation, and so they rush off to do that horrible work. But I would ask you, gospel is supposed to be good news. It's supposed to mean good news. Does that sound like good news to you? Micah is a former Jehovah Witness. He's such an awesome guy. He just has such a heart for God. But the Jehovah Witnesses... As you probably already know, they walk the streets and knock on doors, but they keep careful records. They know every hour they spent out there, every moment that they're working to do this, every door they knocked on, they keep a record. And their salvation is actually based on their time card. If they log enough hours for the church, 
for the Jehovah Witness Church. Salvation is a good probability. But still, as Micah told me, he never really had an assurance. Samuel and Polly, they are two of the most amazing people. They both came out of the Amish religion. Now, Samuel was part of a small Amish group, and there's a lot of people don't understand that there are literally hundreds of different Amish groups with their own rules and regulations and gospels. And Samuel was part of one. And when they had a theological difference inside their group, they just split the group into two. And he said that his group was split several times. And before he knew it, his group had become so small that him as a young man, there were no young women that he could date or possibly marry. And Samuel had such a heart to be a father and to be a husband. He wanted that more than anything. And there were no women that he could even date. And his leaders told him that he would please the church, that he would please the leadership if he just agreed to stay single and work hard. Now, Polly, on the other hand, she was part of another Amish group. And Polly was born with this amazing thick hair with lots of body and curl. And, you know, it's I mean, it's just God's creation, just beautiful and wonderful and But if you have hair that has curl in it, that's not plain enough to please your Amish elders. And so Polly was always getting in trouble because her hair had too much body. And it was got so bad. I mean, if you can imagine this, that her mother would take lard and coat her hair with this lard and just smash it down and smear it down in this greasy, matted mess and send her off to church. And yet, as the day pressed on, because her hair had so much body, her hair would start to stand up, and that displeased her leaders. And so, in Samuel's case and Polly's case, their salvation depended on pleasing the men who put themselves in charge of their various Amish sects. Does that sound like good news? No. As for me, I could be saved as a Mormon by keeping all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, and covenants necessary for a man to become exalted, which means he becomes a God, just like God in heaven. So all I had to do was keep the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, and covenants, and yet... I had no idea of what they were. The church told me I had to keep them, but the church never even gave me a list. I had no understanding of what I should do. Again, does that sound like good news? It wasn't good news to me because I had no assurance that I could be saved. So the fruits of a false gospel, again, are very much like a long trip to an uncertain destination. You don't know where you're going, and you don't know when you'll arrive. When you get there, you don't know if you'll have enough money. You don't know if you'll like it. You don't know if you'll have anything to eat. You don't know where you'll stay. You have no understanding of anything that you're working to achieve. It's just like a long journey. And worst of all, every false gospel that I know of requires that you trust in men. Men decide if you're worthy. Men decide if you're pleasing to God. And men are flaky. They are as, as, they are as bad as a couple of two-timing, unfaithful, lying Elko girls. There is no way that you can trust your eternity to men. Now, a lot of people think that the gospel is showcased in the new covenant in what we find in the New Testament, but it's not so. I want to approach the gospel a little bit differently. I'm going to take you back to Leviticus 16. You see, in Leviticus 16, the Lord introduced Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which became an annual event for the Jewish people. Once a year, it happened. And on the Day of Atonement, they would sacrifice a bull, And the high priest would take a a bowl of 
the sacrificial blood and carry it in to the Holy of Holies, through the, through the veil, through the curtain, into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now, if you're not familiar with what the Ark of the Covenant is, think back to Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you've seen, if you've seen that. That was that chest made of gold, uh, and it had a lid, and on top of that lid, there were two angels, one on the left and one on the right, and their wings kind of spread up over the top of the Ark. This was the Ark of the Covenant, and the high priest would go into that Ark with this bowl of blood, and he would dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the, the area between the two angels. And he did it seven times. One, two, three. Seven times. Not six, not eight, not 14. Seven times. Exactly seven times. And the high priest did this once a year for 400 years because God was painting a picture. So when Jesus came, we would know exactly who he was and recognize his coming. So now I want you to jump forward with me from Leviticus to John 20. And I want to read this. I want you to see this picture, or see this story. Starting in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb. And stooping, he looked inside, and he saw the linen wrappings, now, these are the wrappings that had wrapped the broken body of Jesus. He saw the linen, the linen wrappings laying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings laying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not laying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then he entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they had not understood the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laying. Can you imagine the shock, the awe? You see, Mary would have known all about Yom Kippur. It was a major event in Jewish life. She would have known about the Day of Atonement. She would have known what went on, that the high priest went in with sacrificial blood and he dipped it, his finger seven times and seven times, sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. And now she's looking at the picture of God fulfilled, brought into its fullness. Where Jesus' feet had been, there is an angel. Where his head had been, there is an angel. And between them, on the stone slab, are the cloths that they had wrapped the body of Jesus in. And because his body was so broken, there would have been blood. Now let's look at the perfect picture that God has, has, has shown us for 400 years where did that blood come it came from his scalp because they pressed a crown of thorns into his skin it came from his back because of the scourging it came from his left hand and from his right from his left foot and from his right and then lastly it came from his side when they when they speared him he had already died but when they put the spear in his side Water and blood flowed out seven times, seven times Christ shed blood for you and for me. Now, I don't want you to stop seeing here. 
You see, this is a time of year when I see lots and lots of gory, bloody, gruesome pictures of Jesus. And they, the people that post these, they want to try to make us understand the suffering of Jesus through the physical suffering that he endured at the hands of the Romans. But Jesus wasn't the first one to be scourged by the Romans. He wasn't the last. He wasn't the first one to be crucified, nor was he the last. He wasn't the first one beaten or slapped or spit on. Lots of people suffered lots of terrible abuse and died on the cross as Jesus had done. But there was something different about Jesus. And let's, let's look at the one thing that he did that no one had ever done before. Jesus, while he was hanging on that cross, suffering as men had suffered before, suffering as the man on his right and the man on his left were suffering at that same time, as he hung on that cross, all the sins of the world, every sin of greed, Every sin of passion and lust and hate and backbiting and jealousy, every sin was put onto him. And he bore that weight. But not only that, because he became sin, as Paul writes, the father drew back because he can't be where sin is. And so he drew back and Jesus bore that sin. He bore it alone. And under that weight, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus alone paid for our sins. Jesus had never been separated from God ever since the beginning, which there is no beginning. So for an eternity, Jesus had been with God. As John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus had always been with the Father. He never knew anything else. And now he finds himself alone. And being separated from God is the definition of hell. So Jesus suffered all the anguish, the torment, the pain, the suffering, the fear of hell while he was being crucified on the cross. He had the wrath of God that we deserved poured out on him. He suffered like no man has ever suffered before. Now, I would submit to you that for that few hours, the world got to see what hell was like. We saw the anguish and the torment and the grimaces, the, the, the look in his eye. We saw it all. We witnessed what hell is. Only for those few hours did that happen. Never before and never since. That's how much God loves us. Now, I do love Paul because he took this whole gospel story and he broke it down. I just want to summarize what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. First of all, he says, I declare unto you the gospel. This is not Paul scratching his beard and going, oh, maybe that's what it's like. No, no, no. Paul is making an apostolic declaration. And when an apostle of God speaks in the name of God, wise men listen. He says, I declare unto you the gospel upon which we stand. You see, this gospel, this amazing gospel, this is the hill that we're willing to die on. This is where we plant our flag, and we draw a line in the sand, and from that line, we will not be moved. We just won't. And then Paul continues, the reason that we won't be moved, the reason it's so important, Paul says, and by this gospel we are saved. And he says, if we remember just three things, live according to these things, embrace these things, let them come into our hearts. If we will remember these things, we will be saved. And they are first, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So according to every Old Testament prophecy, Christ came, died for you and me. He was buried and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, you know, and I know, and everyone knows someone who believes in a false gospel. We know people that just don't have any good news and any good hope and any assurance. 
So my challenge to you would be that you would talk to them. Ask them, what do you believe? How do you believe you can be saved? Do you have any idea about these things? Ask them outright. And when they tell you how their gospel works and the things they have to do to be saved and how they can never have an assurance and how they have to please men or, or, or uh, conform their lives to rules that a church or a religion creates, when they tell you these things, share this story. Just tell them this story and let the power of God testify to their hearts, to their minds, to their souls that there is hope in Jesus Christ and that he is the only way that a man may go to the Father.